Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to you this morning. Thank you for joining us as we really try to seek to understand uh, future trends and realities. I think there's so many discussions going around about the future of the office place and the future of work patterns, future sustainability, that sometimes it gets quite hard to understand. And we want to try and work through all that today and try and get a clear view. So thank you for joining us. I'm not sure about you, but I find I get constantly surprised by some of the information coming out at any one time. And I think that's been one of the interesting things of this year, just how much mentally it constantly tests you. I was interested to see this morning that the economy bounced back between July and September by 50, a record 15.5%, which is encouraging. Of course, it's going to fall back in the last quarter of the lockdown, but it's still encouraging that we saw such a bounce between July and September. Um, if we can do that same as we go into next year, then obviously, then it's obviously more promising. And actually, as a result, the economy is not as bad as some of the forecasts earlier in the year. But of course, it's still to be seen, isn't it? I was also interested by a report yesterday emerging by a bank, international bank, suggesting, proposing the idea that people working from home should get taxed more. I can see that's going to go really down really well, particularly with Lauren. Um, you will fight that one every step of the way. Um, I think that might be a slightly hard argument to make, um, but it's an interesting idea to kind of fly around. A major law company also came out saying that the law profession is going to face real challenges in how it operates. And actually, this is the age of disruption. I think certainly the latter. Law seems to survive so long. I'm sure I'll carry on, but I'm sure Ramesh Vala will have views on that later on when we speak to him. Uh, but disruption is certainly the core discussion that's going on everywhere. How will business be disrupted even more as we go into next year? How will it change? What are we going to see? Um, so it's going to be a, an interesting discussion. Um, I think the one thing we can all say with truth and certainty is a lot of our ideas and a lot of our thinking has changed during this period of time. I know my, my ideas of my learning on Zoom has increased tremendously since March. I think my first Zoom meeting was, in, was actually in March. Um, and that's actually moved on tremendously since then. Uh, but actually, our, our thinking on technology has moved on. Our thinking on health and wellness has changed on travel. How many, when will travel come back? I know the forecast will take to 2025 before travel returns to 2019 levels, which is a long journey out. But will it? Will it be the same? How are your views on sustainability? Um, and actually, a lot of people change their views on purpose. We also want to explore about how leaders have changed. And this period, this period of time will have impacted on all leaders in every way, um, in many ways. And actually, how will they come out the other side? Because um, they weren't being left unaffected. And, they, and actually, that's going to impact on how we see businesses run. And how has your thinking changed? Um, we'll be interested to hear that as we go. So all these questions we want to try and answer or give a glimpse into over the next two hours. Um, and we'll be interested, obviously, in your own thoughts. Now, on that note, uh, I'd like to say we're going to run a whole range of polling. I think we've got about 10 polls to run uh, during the session. So we'll be very much interested in your, your views. Uh, thankfully, the, the, the answers to the questions we're posing will be answered today by a series of fantastic and exceptional speakers that we have joining us. So do please keep with us for the period, because actually we've got some really interesting um, speakers come right across the spectrum, as I said, from the law profession to uh, the chief executive of corporate services, Sodexo, to the managing director of ISS Food Service, to Simon Halliday, ex-England International, Rugby International, now chair of European Rugby. Uh, so it is going to be an interesting, thought-provoking to our period, so please uh, keep with us. Now, Lauren, over to you to do some polling questions. Please. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as always, we're very interested in, in your views and um, polling questions are, are something that um, you know by now we are um, avid users of. So the first one is, is helpful to just find out where you are as part of the hospitality sector. Are you operations, ownership, C-suite? Are you in marketing, a consultant, or have you joined us from the education environment? Right, wonderful. So most of you are legal accountancy or advisors. Thank you for being here with us. Next question is uh, really just to sort of set some of the tone for the discussions ahead. And I wondered if you would um, 
let us know. I mean, we see a lot of information, as Chris has said, out there, and it's estimated that full recovery is due to only see about 60% of people returning to the office. Now, is this something that you see as well? Are you seeing or do you agree with? Well, that's interesting. 67% of you do agree that only 60% of people will return to the offices. Now, on that, we will be addressing work patterns as part of this discussion. And um, I wondered if you could let us know what you believe work patterns will return to pre-COVID levels. When do you expect it to happen? Do you think it's 2021, 2022? Could it be 2023? Um, I'm sad to say there are never is an option. Um, it's very interesting. Thank you. Most of you think it's 2022 that we will see a proper recovery to work patterns. Um, a third one, a fourth one, sorry, quickly, is uh, with regard to long-term change. Now, what do you think will be the greatest long-term change that would have taken place as a result of this pandemic? Do you think it will be a fall in daily travel and commuting, um, changes to how we use our office space? Would there be an increased focus on health and well-being? Do you think that we should be focused more on sustainability, um, more technology usage, um, as well as how internal communications are, are managed and how they change. Wow, that's very interesting. So most of you think that you're going to see changes in how office space and offices are used. And the final one for this morning, oh, this part of this morning is, um, do you believe that there will be a stronger desire for more bespoke sort of personal services once again after we have gone past this pandemic stage? Wow, interesting. It's a resounding yes, which is wonderful. I think we all need a bit of uh, personalization. Chris, that is the polls for the moment. So I will hand back to you. That's very kind, thank you. Um, now, we can only do these events with the support of our sponsors and partners. So, look, I'm delighted this morning to uh, introduce you to Maxwell Harding, the founder of Dynamify, uh, which has been making great uh, progress across the food service sector. Maxwell, can I just uh, ask you to say some words? Good morning. Sure thing. So, hopefully, you guys can see and hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so um, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Maxwell Harding. I'm the founder and CEO of Dynamify. And we build online ordering platforms for contract caterers, all in their branding, so that they don't have to have to worry about any of that stress. And key front of house features include pre-ordering, scan and go, table service, uh, and delivery. And then in the back of house, operators can manage their menus, view data analytics, and utilize marketing tools. We've got a bunch of clients in the space, so they include Sodexo, so I can see Julie's, Julie's on the call, who I know very well, uh, Elior, CH and Co, Bartlett Mitchell, Gavin Gava, Lexington, Bashran, The Good Eating Company, uh, and more on the way. And they've all deployed Dynamify's technology into workplaces, uh, manufacturing, unis, schools, stadiums. I think the only place is, is, is prisons that we haven't really gone, <laughs> gone yet. And that's both here in the UK, but also internationally in terms of the US, Europe and Asia. And they're all doing this because it's a much better customer experience. You can lower your hardware and labor costs and obviously capture a lot of data. But particularly during COVID, um, our technology enables uh, COVID secure reopening because you can eliminate queues and shared touch points. And, you know, I guess if anybody's interested in learning more, then reach out to Chris and I'd be delighted, delighted to chat. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for your support as well, Mike, as well. All right. uh, hope you enjoyed today. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to our first session. So delighted to introduce Julie Ennis, the Corporate Services Chief Executive for Sodex uh, UK and Ireland and also carries the title of Country President for Ireland. It's a fantastic title. Um, very much welcome. Um, Sodexo, as you will, many of you will know, uh, operates in 67 countries and serves over 100 million consumers each day. So you've been particularly interested, obviously, in Julie's view 
on what is the future and how this support service is going to change and adapt as we go through this period of time. So Julia, very much welcome. She will be joined by So Yong Hun, their workplace experience lead, um, who's also very passionate about sustainability of the health and wellness and technology. So it should be a fascinating session. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Just try and share the slides. Just one second. And hopefully they will come up now. How are we doing? Okay, here we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and it's great to be here this morning. Uh, I'm hoping those slides will come through. There we go. Um, so as Chris said, my name is Julie Ennis. I am the CEO of Sodexo's corporate services business in the UK and Ireland. Uh, I joined Sodexo uh, quite recently, so in February 2019, and prior to that, I worked for many years in uh, financial services. Um, so Sodexo's corporate business has over 10,000 employees in over 600 locations in the region, and we work with clients across a huge range of sectors from pharma to FMCG, media and technology to financial and professional services, and we provide a full mix of FM, food and workplace solutions. So I think today gives us a really great opportunity to reflect on the changes that we've seen in workplace over the last few months. And also to think about the collective challenge that we all face, uh, working with our clients to make sense of the changes and offer positive solutions that can support organizations and their people as we move out of the pandemic. So at Sodexo, we commissioned research in conjunction with Harris Interactive to gauge consumers' moods and thoughts as COVID-19 has played out. And we've also had lots of dialogue with clients through a series of roundtables and one-to-ones to ensure that we are listening as much as possible and also sharing our thinking. So today I'm going to share some of that research and feedback with you and also talk about vital spaces, which is our new way of thinking about workplace. And as Chris said, I'm joined by So Young, who is the UK and Ireland lead for WX, which is Sodexo's boutique workplace consultancy firm. So uh, firstly, some context. Uh, the world is, uh, the world of work is changing. I think we all know that. And we've seen many of these headlines and other headlines over the last few months. And actually a really good recent data, data set was the CBI's research, which was designed by Ipsos, in which 573 businesses in the UK were questioned last month about plans for remote and hybrid working. And nearly half of the organizations, so 47%, stated that they thought that beyond 2021, that work would be split evenly between an office or another workplace and an employee's own home. So that's really significant because it contrasts with 79% of organizations who in 2019 said that the majority of their workforce were working in an office or another workplace. So it's a huge shift. Um, so a huge shift and what we're seeing is a real consensus actually that hybrid working will be reality for many organizations from 2021 and beyond. So I mentioned that we conducted research. So we've done our own research in conjunction with Harris Interactive. And we have interviewed over 4,000 employees from five different markets around the world. And what we're seeing coming through very, very strongly, which is probably reassuring for most of us on the call today, is that the office or physical workplace certainly isn't dead. So we found that 77% of employees questioned want to go back to the office, either full-time or part-time. And some of the main drawbacks, which are probably not a surprise, uh, expressed by employees during what is an enforced period of home working were the lack of collaboration, poorer work-life balance, probably as a result of the blurred boundaries between home and work, and dealing with less comfortable workspaces. And the pandemic has compounded health concerns for us and created what is a new set of needs linked to both the physical and mental health. 
and nearly a quarter of employees in the UK reported lower mental well-being. And that is absolutely understandable during the midst of a pandemic. And we would all agree that it has been incredibly difficult and an anxious time for a lot of people. But moving forward, we need to think about the ongoing mental well-being challenges that home working and hybrid working bring with them, particularly when it comes to connectedness, loneliness, and also stress or burnout. So fundamentally, this is all new and we really need to reprogram. And we found that younger generations were particularly negatively impacted. And COVID-19 has also refocused everyone's attention on health and safety, thinking about everything from cleaning to air quality to waste management. And in a lot of ways, it has been great for the industry because we have enjoyed celebrating our hidden heroes and the spotlight rightly shining on them for everything that they've done. But despite the headlines on working anywhere, anytime, many employers recognize that remote working can create challenges for building and maintaining culture. So 75% of organizations would therefore mandate a return to the office for at least part of the week. And I think Julie Sweet, who's the CEO of Accenture, sums it up really, really well here when she says that remote working is not a long-term answer and stating that personal engagement remains essential for long-term success. And personally, I have to second that. Um, I moved to London a few months ago and I can tell you I am desperate to get out to meet our clients and teams in person. And I know we've all been amazed with what you know, we've done with technology and today's a great example of that. But as humans, we are wired for face-to-face -face contact and collaboration in person. So there are clear opportunities for us as service providers. Our services are at the heart of employee experience and deliver on making the workplace a really attractive, fun and collaborative space to be. And I think the Harris research found that free food and beverage was in the top five requested benefits for employees. And free or not, the research made it clear how much people valued having access to good food and good coffee in the workplace. And if workplaces do change to become places where people primarily meet, collaborate, bring clients, consumers and guests, rather than carry out desk-based work, then there is a very clear opportunity for us to deliver a suite of food and guest services that are at the heart of that experience. And what we certainly need to factor in to everything we do is the need for more seamless consumer-like experiences for people at work. Because we all increasingly accept, or expect the same digital applications, the same speed, the same ease of use that we take for granted in our home lives. So at this point, I will definitely give a big shout out to Max and Dynamify, who are the sponsors of today's event. As Max said, Sodexo has been working with Dynamify and we have jointly developed 12, which is an app that supports activities such as scan and go, pre-order and prepay, delivery, table service, reservations and loyalty schemes. And we're rolling out 12 at all of our sites and we see it being right at the heart of how we deliver food and hospitality from now on. And finally, on food, we can't forget one of the really positive outcomes of our forced lockdown, which has been that we have all rediscovered our local high streets. We've had time to spend in our communities that we probably haven't had for quite a while. Uh, and we've seen a resurgence of local coffee shops, food shops, local butchers and bakers, all taking the opportunity to reconnect with consumers. And a couple of interesting stats here that build out from that trend. So 41% of consumers we questioned say that post lockdown, locally sourced really matters. And 66% of consumers will try to buy local. So for us, it's really important that we review our supply chains and look at the partnerships that we can develop with smaller local brands. 
And beyond Food at Work services, our research also found that employees want services that deliver seamless connections between their work lives and their home lives. And it corresponds with the, the poll that we've just done. And that could be vouchers and cards. We've recently worked with our benefits and rewards business to develop a new employee experience card, which can be used to help employees across a, a range of services to access services and rewards. So it could be access to food at home, and Sodexo is providing food at home and services uh, or home services in several of our key markets. And then finally, personal and home services such as childcare or care for elderly relatives uh, were all areas that employees were looking for support with, which is quite interesting. So in summary, more is being demanded of us by our consumers and end users, and that corresponds then with increased demand from our clients. And when we're talking to our clients, we're seeing some key themes emerge in terms of what they're looking for to support their organizations and people going forward. So the first thing, and really importantly, is flexibility. So clients are looking for service providers who have the ability to work and innovate fast and be really decisive across all services. So organizations are going to need to flex and be agile to respond to those changing demands that are put upon them. The next thing is more optimized spending on their spaces. And again, it corresponds with the poll. And the CBI survey that I referenced earlier found that on average, businesses expect their office space to reduce by 18% compared to 2019. I mentioned more seamless consumer-like experiences while at work, and more virtual and digital work environments. And then more support for well-being. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later. So considering the full spectrum of physical and mental health. And then finally, the pandemic has really reframed the debate on the interdependency of people, places and planet. So we are going to have to work together to address massive challenges that we have around inequality and climate change. So without getting into too much of a sales pitch, I do want to quickly touch on Vital Spaces, which is Sodexo's new value proposition for workplace. So what's clear for us at Sodexo is that if we are going to remain relevant in the marketplace and continue to act as a strategic partner to our clients, then we have to evolve what we do. And while the traditional models of FM and food at work are still vital components of what we do and what our clients need us to deliver, we need to bring together a compelling mix of services that take us beyond the four walls. So we have to factor in not only the physical workplace, but people and their experiences. And Vital Spaces does just that. So it brings together everything Sodexo can do to support adults at work. And with our breadth of experience in consultancy, space design and planning, benefits and rewards, and employee-focused services like concierge, Sodexo can support our clients with a 360-degree people-centered approach. And while our foundation of soft and hard FM sits within workplace management, we are building out our expertise, often through partnerships, and aligning services that would have sat traditionally in other parts of Sodexo's business. So for example, our benefits and rewards business and our personal and home care services business. So finally, before I hand over to So, I want to close by referring back to a message about Sodexo's approach on sustainability and social value. So we recognize that any approach, any value proposition needs to be underpinned by a clear, corporate purpose and a focus on delivering social as well as commercial value. And the pandemic gives us a chance to reset, renew and move forward based on what is really important. So I think we all have hope about uh, and the news of the vaccine um, and we might be moving forward out of a global health crisis, but we are still very much in the midst of a global climate crisis. And we are also facing massive global and local challenges around inequality, inclusion and poverty. 
And at Sodexa, we are proud that we have made progress on a number of key areas within our social impact plan. And you can see a few of the stats here. Um, and if you're interested, you can read a full update on our social impact report for the last financial year, which we just released there last month. So I now have the pleasure to hand over to my colleague, So Young, who is the lead for our partner organization, as I mentioned, WX. And So is going to talk a little bit more about how we can support organizations with a holistic data-led approach to support well-being. So over to you, So. Thank you, Shirley. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, our approach to workplace well-being and a people-centered workplace design and management. To give a quick introduction, WX is a global consulting studio as part of um, Sodexo. We help organizations quantify and improve their workplace experience through ethnography and IoT and data science. So we believe workplace well-being is becoming more important than ever and climate change is causing concern and fear for the future. And businesses also need to be aware of the uh, impact of aging workforce and also physical inactivity by sedentary lifestyle, as well as the mental health issues. At the same time, more public and private data is becoming accessible and technology is changing the tools and our ways of working. So looking at the workplace itself, the nature of work is changing and work is becoming more flexible and dynamic, but also becoming more uncertain than ever. So workplace is no longer somewhere people just go to every morning, but it has to be something they can feel and experience. And people are the greatest asset, but they are expecting to work on their terms. Um, so businesses can actually uh, differentiate themselves uh, to attract new talent and retain top talent by enhancing their workplace experience. We also need to navigate the crisis and understand some friction points uh, caused by the coronavirus. Organizations try to optimize their real estate footprint uh, and increase cost efficiency, while employees focus on health and safety and also their quality of life. So for the real estate perspective, we used to have multi-tenant mixed uh, use buildings and have been developing sharing economy. But now we have restricted access to uh, each building and space and have also siloed mentality. For the sustainability perspective, we have reduced transportation, uh, reduced building energy use and pollution but have more use of disposable PPEs, plastic packaging, and also hygiene chemicals. So now we need to understand the changing behaviors and trends to be prepared for the return to work and also future workplace. So it's time to rethink about workplace well-being to make a positive change uh, in the workplace. So our understanding of well-being in general uh, is constantly evolving. So previously, good health was the absence of symptoms of disease. So if you were not sick, you were well. However, the definition only describes a neutral state. So now we know that it takes much more than the absence of illness for people to feel positive and perform at their best. So we developed an innovative new approach centered around human health and well-being. So the six well-being concepts introduced here are developed based on the principles of the well-being standards. For example, air is something invisible but has a great impact on human health than any other aspects. So we take a proactive approach uh, to minimize airborne viruses and particulate matters to increase indoor air quality. And also nutrition, we provide a healthy approach to food services on site and design mindful eating spaces that promote healthy eating habits. Also mind um, alongside design of the physical environment, wedding programs and policy are key to supporting opportunities for better relaxation, connection to nature and community, and also stress management. So based on these six concepts, uh, we try to analyze how they affect the function of the complex uh, human body systems. So 
The first thing we do is to create a user journey map throughout the day using ethnographic research, which aims to scientifically describe the culture of the people in a particular work environment. So it involves engagement with people for an extended period of time, watching, listening, asking questions, and collecting data and cataloging any artifacts. Um, so through this exercise, we understand the pain points of the workplace, as well as the needs and behaviors of the people. So based on the findings, we can make uh, useful recommendations for the customers uh, for their future workplace design and management. In the post-pandemic situation, people might have different options to choose where and how to work. So organizations need to carefully understand the challenges people might face and also think about how to support them to successfully complete their daily tasks and also increase the interaction between people working from different locations. Also based on our understanding around user experience, we select and deploy the right tech solutions to the right place. So these can include the management system, loom booking system, or energy management system, environmental controls, and team collaboration supports. So basically a combination of tools that ultimately enhance user experience. So to support this, we are also building an ecosystem with our partners by collaborating with various workplace technology solution providers in the markets. Also through the technologies we deploy in the workplace, we collect and combine data from various sources to analyze the performance of the workplace. For example, insights from users through ethnographic research and real-time sensor data monitoring uh, environmental quality and also simulation data um, that can predict uh, our long a single data set isn't, isn't always perfect, but data from different sources can complement each other. So data gives us insights into the existing employee experience and the knowledge needed to select and design solutions that help create the best workplace experience possible. Then how can we measure the impact and success of workplace well-being? We created a best book method of measuring the impact of our um, user experience and well-being, building on existing market-leading um, survey tools and also mental well-being assessment toolkits. For pre- and post-occupancy, we measure multi-factors, including um, human behaviors, employee satisfaction, occupational health, and physical and mental well-being, emotions at uh, work, so the project outcomes demonstrate uh, it is possible to influence users and also organiza organizational performance through defining and strengthening the relationship between people and the place. But the most important thing is putting our continuous efforts to understand the complex human dynamics in the built environment. So we have recently published a white paper to provide a complete overview of the implication of COVID-19 on workplace. The future workplace must be designed with a deeper commitment to the well-being of the people, recognizing that their environmental, psychological, physical, and social states are linked to their safety. So this commitment uh, requires a phased approach with organizations considering their plans for medium and long-term changes, even as they adapt in the short term. We've been working with a leading FMCG company and implementing this approach to support uh, the well-being of their teams and workplace experience for their headquarters. So our goal is to accommodate the concept of liquid workplace that defines um, an optimum mix between formal and informal working environments, considering the continued needs for collaboration and flexibility and creativity. So that's it for me. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, So Thank you. Can I bring back Julie as well, if that's possible? 
Hi, Chris. Yep. I, if I get myself on screen, it would help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, that, the research is fascinating, isn't it? Um, it's actually yeah. very encouraging. Is it, has it surprised you what's coming out of this? Um, it, it is very encouraging, which is great. Um, so has it surprised us? Maybe, maybe a little. Yeah, maybe a little. I think, you know, when you see the, I think I think it was, did I say 75 or 77? I haven't got it in front of me. Percent of employees absolutely wanting to come back. Um, that is really, really positive. And I think, you know, I mentioned it has been a sort of a, a forced lockdown or forced home working. That doesn't mean it's right. So it's about getting a balance, I think. Um, so we absolutely fundamentally believe it will be a, a hybrid uh, situation hybrid working model and so has talked about that that fluid um, concept uh, because you know including myself as I said I am just dying to get out and visit the teams so and, and it's global research and actually all of the markets have been very similar um, so again there is a very very strong consensus so positive I would say for us yeah it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And the data has also improved so tremendously, hasn't it? The data we're getting through now to understand the situation is improving all the time. A huge amount. And actually, I mentioned the CBI's research. That is, um, it, it's a very, very good presentation, actually. I, I received it there in the last couple of weeks. And again, you know, 18 to 20 percent. Um, I think we're, we all know that real estate's got to change. You know, let's not kid ourselves. Um, but we know that the office is not dead. It's going to be repurposed. There'll probably be less of it. Um, and we know that. But, you know, the data that we're getting from, be it CBI, from yourselves, from, inter you know, Harris and, and all of our local uh, data sets has improved dramatically. And as I said, the good thing is there is a consensus. Um, so, yeah, it's good. No, it's really interesting. Look, I'm going to be deeply unfair here and ask you a personal question. How's it? How's this whole time impacted on you both? How does it say that again? How, how has this period impacted on you and how has it changed your own thinking? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I, I took over the, the new role on the 1st of March, Chris. Uh, so my timing <laughs> is impeccable, has been impeccable. Um, it, has been, it has been a challenge, but I, I am always the optimist. So I'll always look for the opportunities. Um, so I think it has been a challenge in that um, I... I'm quite a social person. I like to be out. So, so sitting on my own in a space is not great. Um, but what I do think is, you know, we have all communicated much more with our teams than probably ever before, albeit virtual. So that has been good. And it has allowed me to immerse myself in the business much quicker than I, than I probably would have. Um, but it is difficult. It is absolutely difficult. From a business perspective, you know, there's obviously challenges. We know that. But I think, again, it has been refreshing to see the pace at which we re we've been able to adapt and change. Um, and we've every business is probably the same, but we've done things in weeks that probably would have taken us a year before. Um, you know, so that has been very encouraging. And I think what we need to do now is maintain that type of culture and level of innovation and creativity. And yeah, I mean yeah. That was one of the interesting slides you had was about yeah. the amount of collaboration and good work yeah. going to society. One of the concerns and one of the questions always raised, will that carry on afterwards or will we just pop that subtly away? Well, think? I think that's the challenge. That is the challenge. I mean, from my perspective, yes, you want to keep that going. I mean, people have moved at a pace. You have to make sure, obviously, that people don't burn out. That is, that is also a very real um, challenge that we have. But Yes, we, want, we, we, we need and want to make sure that that is maintained. And I think that, you know, repurposing the office and bringing people in and engaging them with great food and great coffee, as I said, and great spaces allows, you know, is another way for us to make sure that you can maintain that culture and, as I said, innovation and creativity. So, yeah. It is interesting. Um, the mental health side is also both. So you talked a lot about the mental health side as well. Do you see clients having a greater awareness of this now and being more educated on what's happening? Huge amount. A huge amount. Every client, bar none, um, is focused on well-being and mental health in particular. Um, and we are working with our clients, you know, to, to develop new services. And we've done that with concierge services that I mentioned earlier on. But every single client um, is focused. So, I mean, I think, you know, and so has spoken about it there it is a real, I suppose, 
a challenge for, for all of us, for the industry, to make sure that our services do focus on um, both the physical and mental health um, of people because everything is, is centred around the employee now, wherever they work. Um, and I think if we have that mindset, we'll be able to shift the dial. Um, but yeah, every single client is focused on it. So if, if we're not focused on it, we have a problem. And are you finding the dialogue with clients is changing? Because it's interesting because everyone to me talks to me today about they found their purpose again. Six months in, they've really stripped their businesses back and found their common purpose. Do you find that yourself? Um, yeah, look, Sodexo is a purpose-driven organization. Our mission since 1966 has been to improve the quality of life of all of those we serve and our communities. That has not changed. If anything, it is more important today and more relevant today than ever before. Um, and I think what has been what I'm very proud of, and I, I called out at the end in terms of some of the, the stats on, you know, social impact. We haven't stopped, and I, lots of organisations are the same because you, you, you see it and you, you hear it. We haven't stopped our focus on uh, how we do things um, because, for me, how we operate as a business is as important as what we do. Um, so, you know, we are absolutely focused on quality of life. Uh, and as I said, it's more relevant and has more relevance today um, probably than it did in 1966. Um, so, yeah, we, we are... We're very focused on it. Oh, look, thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting no you both and having you today. Thank you. thank you for your contribution. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Chris. So thank you very much indeed. Um, can I now introduce and bring on the first panel, please, which is Simon Halliday, uh, Abigail Tan, and Catherine Pretzel Shields. Uh, for those who don't know these three great characters, um, Simon uh, Halliday used to play for England in rugby. Um, and was one part of the great England team of the early 90s um, and was part of the World Cup final team of 1991 and the Grand Slam teams of 91 and 92. Um, now chairs Euro Club, European Club Rugby, is also a non-NED Coots and was also um, had a great history in the city, uh, particularly with Leven, so has a great insight from a whole range of uh, factors into what we want to discuss in a second. Uh, Catherine Petzl Shields uh, spent many years, 25 years, I think it was, with American Express, uh, right across the world, and then has most recently been most international marketing director for Paul. And Abigail Tan, delighted to introduce, who is the chief executive at Giles Hotels, both for New York and for Europe as well. So, welcome to all three of you. Um, a bit fascinating conversation, I think, going to come up because I know you all come from different perspectives, but let's just start with some polls, please, if that's okay, Lauren. Yes, absolutely. Just to uh, set the tone ahead of the conversation, we're asking um, after the, the very recent US election, which was fought out by, by two gentlemen in their 70s, do you believe that experience has become increasingly important? A bit of a tug of war on this one. Going to make very interesting conversations for you a bit later, that's for sure. So... Wow, um, 47% say, say yes and 53% say no. I was really not expecting that. Next quick question. Um, do you agree that the pandemic has made leaders more accessible? Now, we debated this one ad nauseum in the office and we don't agree either. Um, yes or no? Well, that is refreshing. It seems that we're right to disagree. Uh, 42% well, say actually, yes. I, th I think that says I'm right, actually, Laura. No, actually, I don't. Um, and 58% says no. The second to last one is um, something that is close to our heart and something we've discussed over many years. And there's an argument that there needs to be greater investment in learning and development. I mean, we were constantly talking about leaders of the future. So do you think that your company is investing enough for the opportunities to invest more or do things differently, perhaps? It seems that 33% of you are, are happy, but 67% are not, so there's definitely room for improvement, which is great to hear. And the final one is um, after this period of lockdown and all these restrictions, do you think that relationships will become more valued? Will they be at a premium 
in people's perspectives once again we've always argued the importance of of relationships and that's wonderful to see 93 percent of you agree that relationships are an essential and will probably be more important as we move forward there you go all right over to you thank you so let's uh, kick off by talking about the polling results uh, are they as you expected um and any surprises there? Abigail, let's start with you on that one. Uh, you did, to be honest with the, um, which question? The one about the US elections? I might leave it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it yeah, uh, well, it's a, yeah, but about the um, relationships being more valued and at a, um, at a premium and people's perspectives being valued more, I uh, definitely agree. Catherine, your thoughts and polls? Is it what you expected? Well, um, <laughs> somewhat. I mean, I think on the U.S. election, one of the things our four founders did when writing the Constitution was to have a minimum age of 35. So I think when you look at experience, when I think of who's leading the surgical department in a hospital, I don't know that 21 is going to be enough experience, right? And so I think there is some time in the saddle whether it's you've observed great leaders and you embrace that or you've had time to actually do it yourself. I'm sure we'll get onto vulnerability in, in a moment, but I think being able to know that we're learning for life and Linda Gratton got it right in the hundred year life and being able to continue to, to learn. So, um, so as an American or dual citizen, <laughs> I think experience does, does matter. I don't know that we need for someone to be 50 before they can be given <clears throat> the range. Well, I mean, that's the point, isn't it? We'll, we shall come back. I mean, the, as we, let me look, before I come back to that piece, Simon, your thoughts on the polls? Were you, were yeah, you... I thought um, one of the, the last questions about uh, investing in L&D, because I, I agree with, with just about everything Sodexo talked about. Coming from investment banking, where uh, I've sat on trading floors with hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands, multiple floors. If you don't invest in that part of the equation the none of what said talk about talks about can be delivered so i think the fact that the majority of people think that there's not enough investment is actually the most telling point because if we don't invest in the in all those initiatives that exo refers to and, and i suspect many more then uh, then you won't get the outcomes that you want from the return to workplace criteria and everything that's been talked about so far that's all fair. Um, let's go back onto the age piece age the experience is is age a key piece now just to give some background on this is that the average age of a chief executive has increased 15 years by 15 years over the last 15 years which in some ways you can argue is a good thing because it's given stability at board level and it, it's not hard to see that the same people have been around for a long period of time the counter argument to that it doesn't allow for younger talent to come up and push at board level and if they don't see upward at the ability to come up, the opportunity, are we, are we doing ourselves out of some energy and youth and, and uh, new leadership, question mark? Do we need to find a better balance than we've got now, I suppose, I'm asking. Catherine? Well, you know, I think the, um, there was a piece that I read a while ago that said, um, the learn-it-all is better than the know-it-all. And so I think it's being able to get the balance um, of that, that needs to happen. Uh, and if we, if we all believe in that and we all focus on that and that's the culture within an organization, then I think that we can thrive in a better way than, than having a closed mind to that and feeling that, well, I know it all, I've done it before. Um, and in my organization or in my previous organization, we did it this way, therefore that works. The tide has changed, bringing fresh water in is essential. Um, and I think the work that Sodexo has done certainly shows that. It's not what we saw 10 years ago in, in American Express, at least, but you certainly are hearing it today. And I think that's great. It's come a long way, isn't it? Abigail? And I think uh, Catherine mentioned a really important word, which is culture, uh, because I think it depends on the leadership culture within the company and not longevity or age. 
most people these days will work until retirement age and therefore most CEOs and senior leaders will be in their post for a longer period of time. So I think the question is almost twofold is how, um, how can longevity and service be used to an advantage and how can we foster and motivate talent and growth without pressuring all the management to leave, especially if they're doing a good job. So I guess, how can we foster communication and understanding also between all age groups uh, in order to create a culture that is malleable and adaptable um, to the never ending changes in, in society that we face and circumstances like COVID and, and the different generations that, that we'll face. And, um, yeah, so I think I, I, the, the the culture piece is, is important as to how uh, the senior leadership also build on that culture to be able to um, to to grow and and challenge the younger generations to be able to improve and train and we you know we talked about learning and development. So I, I, I believe that's an important piece. Simon, you've probably seen it from all sides, oh, haven't you? From all sides. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're good enough, you're old enough. Um, I remember one of the greatest centres ever played the game, um, played in his World Cup final, unfortunately they beat us. Um, he was 19 years old. His name is Tim Horan, and he was good enough. So you're old enough. And I, I think, you know, people grow up a lot quicker now anyway. But I think the, the turning it on its head a little bit, the, it comes down to what the leadership criteria is, you know, what qualities you're looking for. And in my world of banking, investment banking, we often made the mistake of promoting an operator because we thought they were a leader because they were so good at what they did. It didn't make them a leader. And in the same way, experience doesn't make you a leader. It might make you old-fashioned. It might give you reference points. Um, and, and so I think you've got to be careful and, and look at It's all down to what criteria you employ to talk about leadership. And for me, one of the biggest qualities of leadership is delegation. The fact that you've got people around you who are probably much, much better at doing things than you are. And your great skill is actually to empower them and push them off to, to be the next leader by giving them um, a level of responsibility. And for me, sometimes the best leaders are the ones who know how to do that. That's fair. Um, one of the big reasons why this whole subject is important in business is because this whole bit about lack of trust. And there's been lots of research reports coming out. There's been a real lack of trust of leadership teams in business. And actually, the challenge has to be, and the same in politics, the, same has to, the challenge has to be, how do we rebuild trust? Where's the starting place for that? Because if we're not, all the stats that actually came up are very encouraging. The key bit we still need is that trust piece to be corrected. Is that fair, Catherine? Yeah. No, I think it, it is. And... You know, I still in environments these days where you, you question what the hidden agendas are and what's the thing that the leader wants to, to do. And, you know, to have experienced times where I've had amazing leaders that just could not have been a better wind, you know, behind my wings type of thing to help me to, to thrive and, and had my back at every step of the way. And it didn't mean that they wouldn't call me out if they thought something was right, not right but they did it in private so that you could learn from it. And it wasn't to embarrass anybody. And, and I'm sure these are old stories that we've all heard before, uh, but it was those leaders who truly delegated. I might've done it differently than they would have done it, but it didn't mean that it was better or worse. It was just uh, different. Um, and to be able to seek to understand you know, me, where I certainly had those other leaders that said, your job is to make me look good. Because if I look good, then the rest of the team will look good. And I really grappled with that. I thought, well, I get, I get it. We need to deliver the results. You know, we need to be successful in what we're, we're doing. We need to have critical thinking within our area that we can demonstrate that. But it was such a shift that then that wasn't who I wanted to work for anymore because I didn't trust what their agenda was and didn't think that that was being cascaded through, through the team. So there's a big movement, isn't there, at the moment, arguing that, that the real, what every company has to do is look at being genuine and authentic as part of everyone stripping back their business plans. Is that, you think, the same about leaders then? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's authenticity that has to come through in, in everything we do. And I think I've had some really interesting discussions with people about transparency. And they said, well, yes, it's very good to be transparent. But do you need to be so transparent that everyone can see your diary so that you've established the trust? Like, why don't you have 
the trust already? <laughs> why does it need to be transparent all the time? And that's why I think you need to establish that at the start rather than trying to say, no, you can trust me, you can trust me, you can trust me. Well, if you have to say that, then I guess one of the things I never liked was, well, to be honest with you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, so every other time you're not being honest with me. So I think there is there is that authenticity that's there and being able to recognize none of us know it all. And, and we need to be looking at new and different things all the way through, um, looking at different business models uh, and how we're going to you know progress through uh, now and 10 years from now and 10 years after that. Thank you. Abigail? And I, I, I agree with Catherine again. I think she also um, hit it on the head about leaders being able to accept and uh, to outrightly say that we don't know it all and that we're not the expert and that we need their support and their guidance um, to be able to, to drive us all there together. The uh, regular, open, honest communication, uh, of course, is, is essential, I feel, in uh, any uh, well-functioning organization. Um, and, you know, we talked about like a, a form of feedback loop, surveying the team to get their feedback on how things can improve, uh, being vulnerable, also ask, seeking feedback on the, the leaders, seeking feedback on themselves and how they can improve and how they can drive the culture forward and how the team feel about the culture and how a middle ground can be found from uh, between the believers and the non-believers and how we can and create create a uh, a balanced ecosystem. And how has this period affected? Because obviously you're running hotels in America <laughs> and obviously Europe. How has it impacted on you? How has this whole period as a leader? How has it tested you? And how have you changed? It, it it's, it's been difficult because in hospitality we're used to seeing everybody on a daily basis uh, on the and, and having that interaction. Hi, how are you? And and being able to take pick up on 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 body language and different cues. Um, so how, how I've been able to try and keep as much communication with this, uh, as many staff as possible is by sending out a, a, a bi-monthly wellness survey to, to every member of staff that basically checks on how their mental, emotional, uh, physical well-being is, if they have enough supplies, if they would like to talk to um, uh, mental health first aider a few of us in the company are, are, are qualified in that and and I think just showing that to every individual that you care is is important and you know it's sad because we were supposed to have most of our staff come back to work um, last Monday <laughs> and on because of the announcement on Saturday on the Sunday we had everybody had to be called and said okay don't come back to work. Everyone is going back on furlough. So I feel for those who have been on furlough since the end of March and who are looking forward to come back to work in November. And so I think keeping on the, the care, I think, is, is, is important. Yeah, that's a fair comment. Simon? Yeah, I think, I think if you, in terms of losing trust or regaining trust, it, it implies there's been a breakdown in the relationship. Uh, and and um, both Catherine um, you know, said that, actually, particularly about the, that fact. So you need to invest in people and you need to have an open door policy. I remember one of my bosses years ago, his door was always open, always. Okay, you might have to shut it occasionally for a, a, a call, so, but his door was open. He said, come in and talk to me. And he was the boss. So you've got to be present. You've got to walk the floor if that's relevant. You've got to go and talk to people. Ask them their advice, you know, and they're going to think, wow, the leader asked me what I think. I'm just a... I'm just a small cog in the wheel, but the leader bothered to come and talk to me. And I think if you, let's not say and, and sugarcoat the environment at the moment, there's going to be some incredibly tough decisions to make. Also your team, they don't want you to just bring them with you, but they want you to make tough decisions too, because we're not going to get away with coming out of this without tough decisions. But as long as you've got the relationship, people will trust you. It's when you don't have the relationship and you go make big decisions that people think, wow, you know, did that person properly analyze what's going on? I didn't really understand it. No, I was never kept in touch. So it, it's all, it's a progressive thing. It's circular. It can either be a, a virtuous circle or a vicious circle. And if you've lost trust, it's because the relationship hasn't been invested in. I mean, that's the point. I mean, it ties into the accessibility piece. Let's keep you on, on Simon, this piece. Um, because are leaders been accessible enough during this period of time? Have you seen, what are your views on this? Or is there a piece here that people need to do more? Be accessible. 
Uh, I, I mean, I, I remember the, the early days of all of this is um, when I was chairman of European Rugby, I've been Zoom calling with uh, everyone around, we've not been able to move and, you know, we haven't been able to play games and, um, or have crowds and have that usual interaction with the management teams of the clubs and all the rest of it. Thank God, in the previous two, three years, I'd actually been around to see them and I had a relationship already. If you haven't got it, and I go back to the same point, you're on these long distance calls. Um, you can't build it over a long distance. You can't. And so you can be on a call, but actually there's nothing like a face to face. If you haven't done the face to face, you're nowhere. And so I think that's, that's my answer that accessibility doesn't mean on the end of the screen. Accessibility means does that person care about me? They ask me the right questions. They take me to a room and ask me how I am. You can't do that over a screen. And if you haven't done that before, you definitely can't. If you have done it before, then you possibly could. So I think there's kind of remote accessibility, but that's not the right type. Abigail, it must have been your hardest challenge is being accessible to your teams, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it is. Uh, but I, similar to, to, to what Simon said, having the open door, even if you're not physically in the office, is important. And it's something in my uh, monthly communication with the staff, I just continue to try and to reiterate that even if we're not physically in the office, the phone still exists. Emails are, <laughs> we're using them more than ever. Zoom still exists. We try to do um, uh, Zoom events like uh, bingo and, and pub quiz. It's never the same as in person, but um, I think them being, and I think Simon also made a good point, it's, it's, it's about them knowing that not just reaching out to you, but there, there is support at the other end and that you will be listening to them and that you will be able to, to help. And it's not just an empty email that they send and that's regarded, that disregard, disregarded. There's an interesting question, Catherine, coming obviously from the floor about L&D, that obviously this period of time has naturally put off the investment in L&D. But the challenge really is still how do we enable enabling younger talent, isn't it? That, that has to be the piece, isn't it? And how we find that balance between stability and taking a bit of allowing people have a bit of risk to fail, I guess. I, I think it is, and I think it starts to raise the question of the future of education. What is it that we should be expecting from our educational systems to deliver to us? Um, so I think that's a really big question to understand. Um, all the way through the system because we've created these social norms and we've said, okay, that's the way you do it. Well, we need to build back better, right? From every, every step through the process. I've had so many people say to me over the summer, you know, people that have reached out for mentoring that I never would have expect would have said, I need mentoring. And then not that that's a taboo at all. That's a great thing to have. I never learned how to do X or I never learned how to do Y. So they go to someone that they trust or they've seen has done it. So I think there's a lot of learning that happens in informal ways. And both Abigail and Simon have talked about, you know, the limitations of being able to do that on Zoom. But how many people do I know, uh, Julie mentioned, you know, herself, who are, but even completely different organizations. They've never met anyone, you know, that they work for. The other side of it is all the education that is available online through universities, through to great courses. I don't care, quite frankly, these days, what your accreditation is. If you took a course on AI or data or critical thinking or the future of digital marketing, fantastic. You know, I think that's excellent. And, in, and bring that into the conversation. The fact that this is where I think the brands of universities, you know, I'm sure they're not going away. You know, that's going to be there. But I'm more interested in, you know, what's the fuel in the engine? rather than knowing you've got a nice shiny hood. That's a good way of putting it. Abigail, your thoughts on this? And, and I, I agree, learning, I think learning and development is a, a key to any growing organization and it's important to understand what, uh, what the employees want or what your staff want. Um, for, for example, in, in at, at our hotel here in London, a lot of the employees actually have been, we celebrate anniversaries every quarter, and so many of them have been with us for over 15 years. Um, we've known a lot of them without university qualifications, 
um, and basically grew grew up grew up with the hotel. And so I think asking them about what their um, learning and development goals are and how they would like to grow and into what kind of positions. Um, we, we, we started a partnership with the University of Surrey earlier, uh, well, supposed to be this year, so that um, a handful of our staff would be sponsored by us through a master's program to come out of a master's in hospitality at the end of it. And um, pre, pre-COVID, we had a learning and development officer. She unfortunately left because she went back to her home country because she was with the uncertainties of, of COVID. She wanted to be with the family. So I, I, I think gr- learning is always important for your own personal and professional growth and understanding how exactly p- different p- individuals want to learn. Some, some may not, and it's fine. But if they do, to be able to have a platform for them to... Um, to to engage with and 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 do that is important. One of the things for those who don't know you, young girl, one of the big things for you is always about purpose, isn't it? Because you are very much about purpose, about, oh, purpose. Making, sure, <laughs> about making sure the hotels, your business has real purpose, not just in terms of being a successful business, but in terms of how you interact with the community as well. Mm-hmm. I assume, I mean, how has that impacted on the team? <sighs> So what we have tried to do over this period is, uh, so our fundraising activities have have stopped, but it's been about how can we engage, um, use the resources that we have in our hotel to help communities. So for example, um, right now, every day between uh, 12 and two, we have a food distribution service outside the hotel, working with a local charity. So anybody, anybody who wants food um, and supplies can show up um, and and get things that they need milk fruits some vegetables and, and a hot and a hot meal and I think keeping and and so we also request for volunteers within our staff those who are in furlough if they if, if they want to help um, that's available and I think letting them continue to see that even though we're not fundraising for for our initiative hotels of heart we are still trying to to engage with with the community somehow that's interesting. Um, and that's and that's in, that's in, been good for the team, hasn't it? To see that that's the point. It has been. It has been. Yeah. Yeah. Simon, one of the one of the big debates goes back to our relationship piece we've been talking about earlier, is about without it you get too narrow in your thinking. And I always remember the Bank of England coming out after the Brexit vote, saying actually their forecasts have been too narrow for how it's going to impact. And actually, a lot of companies have been concerned that because actually they haven't had relationships and relationships haven't been at the core of business and leadership as previous times, that actually the, the result is you get to narrow in the way you think. Is this something that needs to be changed? And again, is, is this one of the big challenges for leaders now is to actually make me, because if everyone's talking about disruption, we've got to make thinking broader again, haven't we, and more open? Yeah, I think it could be well be one of the outcomes of all of this as, as we come out the other side, because... I mean, I've often sort of said, um, certainly with my rugby hat on, uh, with all the financial pressure, my God, there's been hundreds of billions of pounds of pressure in the rugby world. Uh, we might have to get back to go forward, get back to the future. And I think stripping back to some of the old, not the old, but the, some previous mantras of, of looking more broadly, looking more holistically at things, and people become very pressured to look at their own business model and uh, certainly in my world of investment banking, we had to look outwards to try and bring all the resource to develop the sort of results with, that were expected of us. And, and so from a corporate level, I think that absolutely will start to happen uh, because it will require that relationship building to see a different view of the world. You can't just, you know, I think we've got ourselves into a, uh, a pattern of, look, life's so busy, you know, we're all racing around like crazy people. There's never enough time for anything. Just got to get the result, get the people in, get them working. They might move on. It doesn't matter. And bring someone else in. And so that employability thing, you know, it's all very well having mobile and flexibility of employment, but you don't want people moving on every 15 months. You just don't, you know, and you want people to, to buy into you, to stay there, to be loyal. Give them a plan. I was listening with interest about the education. In, in, in my banking days, we didn't just review people and say what we wanted from them. We said, put down your top five things, what you want to do. Do you want to go and learn more about certain things you don't know enough about? Do you want to be a manager? Do you want to go and travel? Do you want to, what do you want to do? So it's not a record and there is no substitute. You can do course after course, you can go online, you can be sent off, but what you say to your boss or your manager about what you want, where you want your ambitions to be realized, 
There's no substitute and there are no shortcuts, I'm afraid. So go back to some of those core principles. See your person that you care about and show them you care about them by asking them to give their vision of where they want to go. Put it down, review it, and then take it forward. I think there's no substitute. I mean, you worked with Lehman is that probably the worst time in their history. I think it's probably fair to say that it kind of ends. The best and the worst. <laughs> what did you learn from that period of time? Yeah, I mean, we, we had, you know, um, in the early 2000s, um, as we were trying to compete with Goldman's, Morgan Stanley, and, and JP Morgan, some of those blue chips, Lehman was a kind of, you know, we were at the base of the table trying to scrap and compete. So we, we, we couldn't do it on scale, so we went best operator strategy. That was a definitive Lima strategy. We're just going to be the best at what we do, where we play. We can't play everywhere because you just can't build that quick. We then ran into the problem of you might be best operator, but you can't bring it together. So they had all these great, excellent pieces, but they didn't communicate. So we then had to go back and refine that communication so we all work together. Uh, and that made us really at the top of the park because we combined the two of them. And we learned a lot about ourselves then because you had to do what I just described. To get people to buy into it across the world, you had to get them to understand how they got to operate as individuals, but within the team and what their individual visions were and their corporate vision. And if you ignore one against the other, then you got it wrong. So you had to give people the personal ambition to grow with you. And the loyalty premium was huge. So we've got to get that back. Where is the loyalty? How do you make people loyal to you? Do you give them share options? Do you give them reward schemes? Whatever you want to do, loyalty isn't strong enough. I think we rebuild, rebuild loyalty. You know, Lehman was too loyal. I was there when we went down and thousands of us all lost our jobs on the, on the spot. We'll all remember that horrible day. But, um, you know, people were there that were so loyal, stayed to the end and paid for that loyalty in the end. But I don't think any of us regret it. Now, Catherine and Abigail, I'm going to be really unfair on you and bring you in and ask this political question, a bit about, obviously, the American election, which is fascinating, isn't it? Because you've both got, obviously, interests over there. Because is there something to learn from it? Because you've had the highest turnout in history and you've had the loser, in terms of Donald Trump, A, increase his vote and actually get the one, one second highest vote. I think it's coming out to be one of the second highest votes um, in history. Yet they're so polarized. Is there lessons we should be learning about leadership from this? Or what's actually how people are responding and reacting at this point in time? Question mark. Catherine, I'll put you on the spot first. Oh, I thought you were putting me on the spot by quizzing me about rugby. So, okay, phew, I'm going to <laughs> just take uh, the US election. Um, I'll, I'll be very transparent. I didn't vote for Trump. Um, and where I do believe he has done some good things, and I do think there are policies and things that need to change. The culture, going back to the culture of the country, um, was becoming toxic. And most Americans really don't give a toss about what, hap what international thinks of them because they're much more concerned uh, about what's happening at home. You've got 50 states to worry about. You can't really worry about you know, people who are on the other side of the pond. Um, it doesn't mean that those who don't live abroad or do business in the world don't care about it. So there is definitely that voice. But when you look at the population itself, it wasn't the first thing that it thought about. But being able to see what you could and couldn't do with your neighbor, and when you couldn't have a conversation anymore, when the, the leader of the organization was setting a tone um, that was not uh, you know, embracing the whole country, it, I just couldn't do it. Um, I just couldn't couldn't do that. So I think the I think the election went the right way. I think he's asking some fair questions. I've got some questions too, but I don't think it'll change the actual result. But what it says to me, we have some people who feel very disenfranchised, and it is the job of not just the president, but the Senate and Congress and all of the local um, representatives to be able to bring all of that you know together. And it won't happen in the next four years, right? It's too big that it's going to happen in the next four years. But I think getting the right tone, getting the right culture, getting those conversations going, letting the representatives of each of those different movements and things be a part of that and enabling the grassroots to do what they do will help to at least point us in the right direction to be able to recover, to reset, to remind people of what the U.S. values really are. 
um, and to then move into you know the next 10 to 12 years. Because that's the really interesting thing out of it is the kind of argument between populism, but actually leadership is more complicated now, isn't it? Because it is about how you bring the whole organization with you. It's not about you as a leader anymore. It's about continuous learning and bringing diverse societies together all the time. Abigail, your thoughts on this? And following on from what Catherine said, I think per the, the, the elections, the elections, post the elections, uh, how can you change this uh, 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 polarization and the very toxic culture that is now, it, well, has been happening and is happening in the country and post election, it might be even more dangerous because you still have someone like Trump who's very powerful or has a, who has a lot of followers who listen to every single thing that he says. And so when he leaves office January 20th, he will still have so much power over so many people. How many voted, 71 or something million still people million. still voted for him that who will still listen to him. So it's going to be really difficult for anyone coming in to be able to um, change almost, uh, well, a bit less than, 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 than half the country's um, ideas. So I think it, it will be an interesting next uh, four years to see how you can, the, the communication piece can change and possibly uh, people become a little bit more, well, I think the world, everyone, uh, we, get a, we all get affected by politics. How everyone becomes a bit more educated on how to listen and how, what to believe and what not to believe. <laughs> oh, fake news. Simon, any last thoughts on this? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know, looking at across from the other side of the pond, uh, I think uh, we just need, uh, my view, need a bit of stability and uh, a little bit of moderation. Um, I think we were seeing some extreme views of the world. We might have a similar thing over this side as well at the moment. So, you know, there's a middle road and uh, we commit, it became, it became a figure of fun, in my view, Trump. I mean, through this lockdown, my God, the number of videos I've been sent, taking him off or just taking things out of context. I mean, some of it's hysterical. Other bits are tragic. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of, 71 million people voting for Trump. I'm wondering what the Democrats didn't do to try and appeal if you can't have a, an absolute landslide against the background of that extreme behavior. Uh, look, it just tells you that, that America is a very diverse place. Um, and, uh, you know, every time I've gone there, uh, I've loved it. And, and I may say, Catherine, if, uh, Abigail, if, um, if the USA ever get their act together on the rugby field, they'll win every World Cup because they have all the athletes and all the potential. They've already won the World Sevens. Uh, so the shorter form of the game, they're amazing. So I'm always in awe of the, the USA and uh, long may that continue. Oh, thank you. Thank you to all of you for your views today. Thank you for your time. Uh, Lauren, can I bring you back in? Yes, I'm still just choking on Simon's comment. I mean, as a as a Springbok and world, <laughs> I think we're quite happy with how the Americans play. So we'll definitely leave it at that. Don't yeah, tell anyone. England, England, England will be back. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we've got three years left, so we've got time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you um, very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mark Davies, who's managing director of ISS Food Service. Mark is kindly there. He is. Hi. Um, kindly agreed to share some thoughts with regard to ISS's perspective. I mean, the webinar today focuses um, on work patterns and, and offices, and we saw from the poll that that was the biggest thing that the audience thought was going to change as a result of the pandemic. May I ask what your and ISS's perspective is with regard to how you think offices will change in the future? Hi, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's well. Um, uh, yeah, ISS's take on the office. Well, um, I think in summary, and without wanting to sort of tread on some of the stuff stuff that's already been said this morning, uh, we don't think the office will will, will die, um, but certainly will be uh, completely reimagined. And certainly, uh, the office is probably a topic at board level of many corporations and on the CEO's agenda of many companies more than it's ever been before. Um, and therefore, the services that are going to be performed um, will also be completely rethought. And that will depend as well in terms of where the office is cited. And you heard some of the conflicts and contradictions 
um, that, that exists between what you want an office to be and some of the, the COVID impacts um, that we've also experienced during the last six to nine months. So really careful consideration for that workplace experience is going to be so important. Um, but before we get to that point, is to really uh, get to the purpose of an office. Why does it exist? Um, what do we want it to be? Um, what activities will be performed within that office? And then from that point, you then sort of work work back. So, I mean, in summary, um, we think that the office activity will be less task-based and more activity will be around three things. It will be around projects, it will be around people, and it will be around priorities. The things that are really important that you need to be together and connecting. And of course, the way that those three activities will then engage with the rest of the workplace experience, and particularly food, is going to be um, really, really important to us. And, and then just last, sorry, just lastly is, um, I think has already been mentioned, we think we're going to be this switch between probably 70, and I think some of the stats were a bit higher than that, 70% of the people will be static in the office every day, uh, to 70% of the people being transient so we call them huggers and hoppers so we're going to have a workforce that's coming into our workplaces that are going to be much more transient and therefore how we provide services to those people will also have to fundamentally uh, fundamentally change um so yeah that's our, our th thoughts well, I know, well, you know, Chris and I I'm often joke about uh, getting me back to London and uh, that, you know, working from home is, um, well, if they add the tax uh, disadvantage attached to it, I suppose that's going to reframe the conversation. But um, the central argument, I suppose, really is about, you know, us needing to bring people together. I, I enjoy working from home, but I do miss people and I miss that collaboration. We need to get together socially. I mean, Sodexo and, and yourselves are very aware we, we are creatures uh, that need that interaction. We need it for better communication, better engagement. I mean, do you think that, um, you know, it, food service actually has an even more vital role to play now you know, post pandemic and looking towards the future, helping teams rebuild, helping businesses rebuild, helping that cultural piece that Abigail touched on. Um, because I know we are famed for, for often making the argument that um, food service has been undervalued historically, that we haven't made a great argument for ourselves. Is now maybe that the time for us to shine? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. Um... Uh, but as a as a caterer, we shouldn't assume that that all, all companies will agree. I mean, well, let's let, let's we have to make sure that the food services that we provide do fulfil that role in creating uh, great workplace experiences and and are the thing that will connect people with those places that they're going to, having been away from uh, to them for, for for a long time, and 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 never never. Um, I would be humble almost in that, you know, to, to restart an office, you absolutely have to do cleaning, you have to do security, you have to maintain those buildings, but you don't have to do food. You know, food can be delivered in, food can be eaten out. Um, and so, so we've got to say to ourselves, well, what is it that will have the best impact on an organisation and its people by having food on site? And that increases our understanding of our purpose in the delivery of that new workplace experience but then raises the bar in terms of how do we make sure that we can realize all of those things that we know food services can do in this new um, in environment um, we um, we always knew that our people were the thing that enabled workplaces to come to life and we call it the power of the human touch and during during the pandemic we've actually evolved our purpose uh, to become uh, connecting people and places to make the world work better. So we now actually think that our, our services are going to be fundamental to the reason why people will come to places and bring those places to life. And the two things, those places where people work and the services that are performed are going to be um, intrinsic in how people feel about coming to the office. 
No, absolutely fair. Um, I, I'd never thought you, you make a valid point about, you know, being humble that we, we um, I always think of us as an essential, I suppose, because all of our worlds revolve around food and we know how much joy that brings. And there, there's that, um, um, as you said already, that whole wellness and well-being thing. But I, I am respectful of the fact that it is business. So there's always this question of costs, um, especially when you're looking at, you know, all the clear measurables that are associated with it. But isn't it maybe time that we, we focus more on value, that it's not, it's not only about cost and it's value that food service can bring? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, th- I do think food services, you know, pre-pandemic was starting to get taken for granted and it was seen um, more of a, as, a, as a commodity. And certainly there were lots of customers that were looking at, as they were procuring services, they were thinking about the competitive that was going to be added by reducing the cost of it rather than improving the organisational effectiveness of their workplace by having great food services. And I do think that whole really fundamental review of of purpose is going to be really important. But therefore, we need to make sure that um, as organisations rethink what their workplace will be and have people at the centre of those strategies, food is going to be a really vital part of that. And and I think we can see that emerging um, as a trend. And all of those other things that we've heard about already this morning about connecting people, nurturing both talent, engagement, culture, health, well-being, physical, mental. I think food has a real vital role to play in that. But yeah, you're right. We shouldn't necessarily assume and we need to make sure that we can deliver to that high level, higher bar that I think we should set for ourselves. I mean, previously, we know from statistics around mental health and well-being, I think um, it's very outdated, um, so forgive me for my, my outdated data, but Vitality did a report um, not so long ago, so it was 2019, that was sort of saying presenteeism and sick days, I think sick days was up at 35.6, uh, 35.6 days per person sick day. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, when we're looking at all those sort of stats um, and we're trying to look at measurables it's often would be so much easier if we could say right so presenteeism and sick days are directly associated with and if you improve your food service then I mean it would be great if we could possibly measure our impact better do you think there's there's room for that in the future yeah wouldn't we love to have that really <laughs> great we need measure that is, uh, yeah and it, it's you know you're talking about in the united states it's a lot easier in the united states to to make that financial metric because of the private system of healthcare rather than our nhs and therefore you can really bring down the cost of healthcare um directly connected or well, more directly connected to food than we can here in the uk um and, and i think the future will be if we think about organizations being more people-centered and therefore really thinking about some of the things we've already heard about learning and development and training and engagement and culture, then actually you would say that food services would sit much more within our people strategy and you would then measure the effectiveness of your organisation more closely to some of those people metrics, whether that is employee engagement, happiness, um, uh, sickness, etc. cetera. But, but there are so many different things that can contribute to it. I, I think we should be clear in saying that actually food services will be a supporting KPI to some of those other big organisational measures. And of course, some of those measures are quite simple. How many people, how popular is the service that we provide? Um, And if you've designed that service to deliver some of those great organisational outcomes and you've got lots of people choosing to take up that service, you can then say there's a direct correlation. And things like asking customers and getting direct feedback or indirect feedback um, to give your, the level of satisfaction Um, And happiness around having great food services, I think, will be the two probably key metrics that will enable you to demonstrate the importance of food services as part of a broader people strategy. Yeah, and your happiness at the workplace is something that isn't essential. And I suppose with um, people working from home so much, they've really missed out on that friendship. And we, we're always talking about the, the need for friendships in the workplace. And that definitely being able to collaborate around great food um, can only be a positive. I totally agree. I mean, we've joked before um, about 
changed. Gosh, how much has changed in the last six months? I think everyone's on version 47.2 of the plan that was the plan before the plan. Um, but I mean, during this time and, and I suppose planning for the future, have you seen a change in how operations and clients are, are looking and, and talking about food service, about health, about well-being, about that whole culture piece that we, we're very passionate about? It was always on the agenda before the pandemic, but these are the things, these are just trends that have just accelerated, haven't they? Yeah. Um, um, and and certainly, um, I think for everybody, individually, organisationally, there is a much deeper connection and empathy towards people, full stop, just towards humanity. And therefore, as we think about the rebuild process, that human resources, people's strategies, corporate responsibility, social values, sustainability are all going to play a much greater role within corporate strategies. And therefore, uh, food services has such a big, important way in which you can enact those strategies through activities every single day within your workplace, then I do think it will be important. And therefore, and again, I think you've heard today already, in, in terms of the food services that we provide have to absolutely meet some of those organisational goals around responsibility, social value, sustainability, health and well-being, as well as experience. Because if they don't, we're probably not going to be hitting the needs of organisations or the, the, the employees that we serve. I suppose that's also a refreshing piece is that some of those that you mentioned were peripheral um, pre-pandemic and conversations mm. and that they they now have moved to the core for the mm. future. Do you think the pandemic may have sort of refocused businesses on, on people or um, on the importance yeah. of? Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, let's not forget, you know, ultimately we serve uh, many corporate serve stakeholders, uh, whoever, they, whoever they, they, they may be, and that is a priority for many organisations right now in the middle of a crisis. Um, but I do think that there is a balance between dealing with the short term crisis that's going on at the moment and surviving and also that burning desire and ambition to build back better. This this term that we're all talking about. And I think when we think about that longer term, I do think those things come into play, those real people centred and social centred strategies will start to emerge but not yet. I still think we're going to be talking about the spring ball. We can really start to kick in those things. But certainly we're thinking about them now. And I think that helps us, you know, the, the, the right now where we're dealing with some very dark times within our uh, industry is to is to is that growing desire to build back better and therefore thinking now as to what we want the organisation to be. And I think it will be this real bounce back as we get through this and then really have almost more ambition about the future um, and, and I think those things will be centric to those ambitions. As this time has been wonderful when we look at the levels of kindness and care and kind of collaboration with all parts of the industry. I mean, you, I was thinking um, it, it was quite refreshing when we were talking about Brexit and I actually, you know, we always say we, we really miss it. Um, but I suppose when we were talking about Brexit, we were also talking about things like food trends and people were, were really enjoying that authentic change of, um, of food that they, they found on a holiday. I mean, we've all been locked down for so long, we can't spell holiday. But um, in saying that, lots of people have been cooking at home because delivery doesn't deliver everywhere, I found out. Um, and with that, I, I think the stats came out that sort of there's been a 30% increase in, in the use of fresh produce which is music to my ears but do you think that um that people working at home having to cook from fresh feeding their families in ways they possibly haven't before is going to change customer expectations or, or change food trends for the future for our industry yeah sorted aren't we that we want to be talking about brexit uh, <laughs> i know how Good bad afternoon. is that yeah, I, I mean, I do think that the uh, food trends are uh, ev evolving and, yeah, our, our relationship with food will have fundamentally changed, whether it's just the availability of food or whether it's, you know, you, you, you're a novice that's experimenting with cooking at, at home or you've developed your skills and talents. So if we think about when our can, customers will come back into the workplace, they would have had a year out almost in many cases um, and their relationship with, with, with food would have changed such a long time since they've been back. So 
we need to make sure that we understand that the relationship with food has changed and really get to the or almost get to the essence of um, what employees want from their food services. And I think in the past, we've probably been more client led. And certainly now we need to be more consumer or employee led um, in our thinking, just because of those fundamental shifts that we've had as people, as individuals, as society in our relationship with food. No, absolutely. And I, and I know a fair few have, who have dipped their toes in differing diets, you know, veganism and whatnot, because they've had the, the opportunity to avoid temptation. Um, so, yes, I'm sure we're going to have to. But, uh, I don't think we'd have to overcomplicate it. I think it needs to be nice and simple. I think we are talking about, you know, comfort, happy food, something that's going to cheer us up. I think that's going to be really important to us. Um, and I do think people are going to still want to explore different experiences. And I think we need to make sure that we um, we, we have that available. Um, and, you know, fundamental things like more nutrition or better nutrition within the food that we serve. Um, more veg. Yay! You know. <laughs> I'm an avid <laughs> veg. Yeah, more, 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 more veg and, 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 and more interesting ways of, of, of cooking and, and, and eating veg. Um, and then, I, you know, I do think we'll, we'll see lots of trends emerge beyond, you know, the next, the next six months. But I think some of the fundamentals... Um, will be set in stone for 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 a, for a, for time to come, um, but I think it's already been mentioned again today that idea of making sure we can personalise the the service. So uh, almost you know more 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 bistro than carvery, you know more cafe than canteen. I think that's a big shift in the way that food services will be performed in the future. Absolutely. The, um, the, we had the Alex Partners um, uh, event growth report last week and 100% of those in attendance agreed that business models have to change for the future. I mean, there's no surprise there. Um, but th another one of those funny ones was uh, I heard recently was never waste a good crisis, which um, I, always good in, for a positive spin. But with so many chefs being displaced um, in this crisis and, and some of them moving out of cities and moving into to countrysides or provinces, do you think that there's going to be new models created because of that or, or new sort of delivered in products that we might see in the near future? Um, m m maybe. I mean, certainly you're right on both counts. I do think that there is, um, has definitely been a shift out away from the cities naturally because of the, the, the lack of work in cities and it would have moved out into the regions. And certainly I think that there's been a, a, a growth in, in delivered in solutions, not necessarily directly connected. And I also think that I'm concerned as people come back into work, particularly in the cities, um, I, do we have um, the, a big pool of talent available to draw upon mm. to provide on-site services? And also the, the risk that's probably going to be associated with the jobs that come from city-based workplaces particularly as people think about well uh, you know is this is this really sustainable for you is this a good career move so I do think there's some work work to do um but certainly I think that the delivered in solutions is a is a is a client choice not necessarily a consumer choice I don't think consumers care whether it's delivered in or delivered in house and certainly I think that there is um certainly advantages um, associated with on-site production. I think you've heard some of the things already about understanding your supply chain and, and, and be able to create better experiences through on-site on -site production. That's not to say there isn't a place for delivered in, but certainly I think that the debate around um, on-site production or delivered in is something that will be very much associated with um, caterers and clients. No, no, fair enough. Um, we, uh, we've, we've chatted and it is no surprise. I mean, hospitality hasn't always been the first one to put their hands up when it comes to technology. But in the last six months, we, we have moved at least five years forward. Um, whether we'd like to or whether we've been forced to, we have. And do you think that looking to the future, technology is something that is going to be a massive driver of that change or continued change? Um, y yes, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I certainly think just more broadly, if we get from a workplace experience point of view, I think it will be much more digitally enabled. Um, you know, ISS is developing a My Workday app and there'll be all sorts of things that you're going to be able to do from that app um, through all of the different things and activities that you'll be doing through the day. And of course, getting food will be will, will be one of those one of those things. And technology enables you 
to have food in the way that you want it. So I think it plays to that trend on personalization as well um, and convenience associated with payments and everything else. So I do think there's a big place in it. I, I, I think um, when we strip it all out, and, and actually I still think we get a bit carried away with some of the functionality and the sexiness of user experience of new tech, I think fundamentally it has to fulfill a consumer need because the time and the effort associated with putting in a digital solution is quite significant. And, it, and if it's not used very much, then who, what, 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 what need are you serving? Um, and it has to work for the consumer. It has to work. Um, so it, if, if it doesn't work, I think consumers will be put off very, very, very quickly. And I guess the last thing is just got to be viable and sustainable for both the client and the, and the caterer as well. So it's got to, it's got to fit. It's got to work. You can't have, lots and lots and lots of different digital services available that isn't streamlined and integrated in some way and could be cumbersome. So I think we've got to make sure it works for ourselves, work for our clients and work for, for consumers. But certainly I should see there being a need for it and it will definitely change the way in which services are received in, in, in the future. I suppose it will, yes, help towards that efficiencies and, like you say, streamlining, making things easier, not, not complicating it. Yeah. Um, my, my last question is, is a bit of a, a selfish one to you, you as a leader. I mean, um, we, we chatted previously. It was, I think you had said in the last six months, if you were a leader in this space, you would have had either the pleasure or the displeasure of having uh, about 15 years worth of leadership experience in this time um, and having had to do things or think about things that you would never have needed to do previously. Now, I just wondered, ha have this pandemic and crisis sort of changed your thinking, changed your thoughts for the future, your behaviours? And the second part of that is, you know, do you, what do you need, think is needed from leaders, especially when we're talking about the future of, of, future of leaders, the new talent that we need to, to be looking after at this time? Yeah, what a nice question that was. Um, Pleasure. Uh, yeah, so, so, so yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think if everybody that's gone through this uh, will have huge amounts of experience that they would never have got. Um, and yeah, I, I heard it somewhere that this one year will be equal to 15 years worth of, worth of experience. And I think someone else said about, you know, being a knowledge leader or a learning leader, certainly we've all switched to being a learning leader because we don't necessarily know um, exactly all the answers. Um, and that's quite difficult for, 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 for us as leaders who want to be able to have all the answers just to not be able to and therefore look to your people to work together and collaboratively virtually in order to create and find the answers. And certainly the value of some of those subject matter experts in organisations, those people in health and safety, those people in nutrition, those people in IT have really come into the fore as we're looking for answers from some of those specialist uh, people which we probably took for granted before and actually now really value their, uh, their expertise and their, and their input. In terms of how I feel that like I've changed, I mean, certainly have deep, profound, you know, respect um, for uh, the responsibility that I have as a leader to lead people through, through this pandemic um, and, and a, and a, you know, a deeper sense of purpose of the organisation in which I lead and where it fits within society and, you know, start to, particularly within our workplaces where they've all been closed, is to say, OK, well, why do we exist? What, what's, our, what's our reason for being? Which is the kind of question you would never really ask yourself in the, in the past. It was all um, much more strategic or tactical um, solution-led. Now we're, we're really searching to the heart of what we, what we do. So that's something that I think will, will, will stand us in good stead for the future as leaders. Um, I've also learned as leaders, you shouldn't always act selfishly. I think make sure that you're considering the needs of your customers and your suppliers and your employees and the planet in all of your decision making. It's very easy to be very narrow minded in terms of your thinking as you're trying to fight this for your organisation. Um, so it's, I certainly think that is something that will, will, will come through. Um, how to culturally retain the bonds virtually that would normally happen physically in, in an office has been an interesting change. Um, and the other thing is, and I think it's been really valued, is the collaboration within our industry as a collective. And I think as leaders, we shouldn't 
almost revert back to being the, the, the ones that always compete. I think we need to understand and we still work together on the value that we have in society um, as food services businesses. Um, and I guess there's sort of, sort of two other things. One, that idea that uh, it's really, I know it's really important to EP, that nurturing talent and supporting young people, because those are the guys that are, are going to have to live with the, 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 the fallout from, from the pandemic um, for many years to come and making sure that we support young people and provide them with opportunities and great mentoring and coaching and support and development, I think is also going to be really important. Yeah. Absolutely agreed. I think that's one of the the biggest things that um, that we've heard from, from industry is that it's been refreshing to see that leaders have had to stop and listen and work together to then lead um that and that's been a leveler regardless of of where you know where you're from um yeah and i you know uh, you, you guys at ep created the fueling productivity group uh, and that you know was a good example of how industry working together to 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 understand the importance of this the things that we do uh, within the organisation, we work within society as a whole, and I think that's going to be even more important. I think maybe fueling productivity might not be enough now. It might be fueling purpose might be the, the thing that actually we need to cling on to because I think there is a certain level of productivity that's been done without necessarily having food services, but food services will play an even more prominent and important role is in the build-back process. Mm, so one to think about well, EP could consider us um, amending it to our plan 46.3 to fuel, <laughs> fueling purpose rather than productivity. Um, but we'll keep the productivity in there, absolutely. And work hard if we are haggers or hoppers. I love that. I'm going to use it. Um, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for always being kind and, and sharing. Um, Bye, Mark. Bringing Chris back because he obviously appreciates my IT skills and um, how you know IT department has improved an EP. <laughs> well done, Lauren. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Uh, some really interesting points. I actually agree. I think the purpose piece is actually going to come crucial. And actually, that leads on. That comment leads on perfectly. So, can I introduce Ramesh Vala OBE, um, Global Ambassador Pins, and Gavin Goody, head of marketing with RA, please. Hello. How are you doing, guys? Yeah, good. We're just waiting for Ramesh. Ramesh, you coming? Joining us? Yeah. <laughs> Because actually, I'm looking forward to this because I think one of the bits we haven't yet touched on is how behaviours have to change as well and how behaviours in workplaces are going to change because we've talked about productivity, we've talked about the great services going on, but actually, there's going to have to be lots of changes as well in workplace. Now, Ramesh, I said earlier, and let's start with you, um, that you know, the law has, has already been spoken out loud by law companies, they're going to have to change. You're going to have to see some radical change in how you behave as well as a law company and, and behaviors as well. Your thoughts on this? Um, yeah. Chris, uh, could, can, can I just start by wishing everybody happy Diwali because this is uh, the start of our festival uh, over the next five days and it's the, the victory of good over evil. And, and in, in a sense, just uh, reflecting on what some of the previous speakers have said, uh, I, look up, I look upon the pandemic is almost a divine pause button to say uh, the lifestyle that we were all leading, rushing around, as Simon talked um, and described so vividly, was completely unsustainable. And so we needed something which would make us stop, realize and reflect on, on what we are doing and what really matters. And I think, I think um, um, law offices have always been very difficult places because whether it's people at very low levels in terms of paralegals who you worked low, very long hours or this whole thing about presenteeism and being in the office um, <clears throat> before your boss got in and, and leaving uh, late at night, etc. And, and this is something which is reflected not just in, in the UK, but in other countries as well. I think this was just something which was not productive at all and, 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 and really um, unsustainable, unsustainable. And, and, and I, I think... Uh, I think this is a great time, especially for uh, law firms to reflect on purpose rather than just profit and, and actually look at, look at uh, um, how we help our, our, our staff progress rather than just say, look at the KPI all the time and say, okay, what matters is the end product and the profit. So I think, I think there are 
there are several discussions going on and but um, I think as far as the office is concerned, I agree with uh, Julie and everyone else who's talked about this. And I think if you go back to what's happened in the last few months in, in, in Asia, for example, we have three offices in China, Greater China, and all those offices are back to normal. Now, one could argue that they've had the experience of SARS and MERS and they do, they do know how to deal with these sort of things and the behavior pattern is very different as well. But I think... I think um, I think uh, even even me in my sort of uh, 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 ancient sort of age uh, miss the spontaneity. I miss the idea of collaboration. I miss, miss the idea of meeting people, especially the younger people, learning from them, and also being able to impart maybe some knowledge, some sort of, sort of success stories and things. And uh, and and I, I think what we are focusing on is that yes, the offices will come back, but there will be more places where you turn up because you enjoy the culture of being in the office and you, you have the collaboration. And then, then we want to be able to send those people with it to the homes or elsewhere as goodwill ambassadors rather than just employees. So, I mean, that those, those are my sort of different initial thoughts. So I, I, I don't look at the pandemic as just uh, something that dreadful that's happened, but I think something good will come out of it. Well, look, I think that's right. I think it's a period of reset. Gavin, your thoughts on this? Because it is, many people see this as a whole reset to actually correcting some of the wrongs that we've got wrong over the last decade or whatever it is. Yeah, I can agree more with Ramesh. I think, yes, the pandemic has been a tragedy. It's been a very difficult time for everybody. Uh, but, you know, I see this in a very positive way as well. There are a number of silver linings. One of those is that it's given us the opportunity to sort of stop and pause and think about what's important to us as a business, as an organization as a culture, um, how we articulate who we are. And it gave us that moment to just really think about what's important going forward and how we want to rebuild that business. So, you know, we came up with something called the RA Way. Uh, and that it was really an interesting exercise, speaking to all the stakeholders, to my colleagues, to our clients, and further afield, some of the consultants within the hospitality industry. And the way we've repositioned this, we were committed to six of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now we're committed to 10 of those. We have ambassadors to make sure we have a plan of action against each one of those goals, which are very tangible. And we're going to report on those on an annual basis to make sure that, you know, we're keeping to our promises. The other three key pillars which really articulated throughout this process was one around community. We now have a HEV community, Sonny Cavallo, uh, and we've launched quite proactively a, a very active program of, of what community means to us, both on an individual, on a group, on a contract basis, working with our clients to develop you know, a purpose agenda. Uh, that can be working with local partners in the, in, in the regions, that could be working on a nationwide basis. Uh, we're committed to a number of our organizations ourselves, such as Calm and Mind. So we do a lot of fundraising, we promote the agenda. We talk about them a lot, so we'll have uh, thought leadership or we'll have panel discussions. We have one in two weeks' time, which is all about uh, men's uh, mental health with a number of key senior leaders from across our organization, talking about their own personal experience with, with mental health and what that means to them, just to raise their agenda within the organization as well. Uh, and then the other two pillars are about health and well-being, which many of the panelists have. Okay. So we've developed a new program with Hugh Fairley Whittingstall. Um, he incidentally has a book coming out and that uh, may have been an inspiration uh, behind our uh, Waste and World program uh, in partnership with River Cottage. Uh, and that's really based on five key pillars. So that's our physical activity, nutrition, mental well-being, mindfulness, and sleep and recovery. Uh, so we have key partners all around that from Nuffield Health to Mental Health uh, First Aid Association, uh, et cetera, to assist our clients, to assist our colleagues, again, on a nationwide level with all aspects of their well-being. Uh, and then finally, our agility and dynamic program. So as we've had to pivot, as everybody else has, I think that's one of the key words of this year, uh, you know, we've changed tack many times. So now we have a greater focus on central production kitchens. Uh, we have a new concept called E10, which is our sustainable cafe concept, looking at all aspects of sustainability within that. We're also delivering it in a way which is far more effective, whether we need to scale up or scale down, working with our CPKs. Uh, we work with people like Corso, who is a data 
uh, driven intelligent management support system. So that's quite a, that's a lot of change in a very short period of time. Of yes, um, in six months, you've probably done more change than you would have done in three years. That's oh my goodness, it is, it's outrageous. We've literally, our original plans, this was all in the pipeline before the pandemic. The pandemic has just sped that up. It's given us an opportunity, though, to focus on it on the key things. Uh, and now, over the past few months, we've been marching these one by one. And I think 2021 is actually going to be a really exciting year. In many regards. No, I, I agree on that. Actually, I think today, one thing I've seen today is actually the thinking has come forward quite markedly, hasn't it, in the last year? Ramesh, are you seeing, what are you seeing out of this period yourself from the other side? Um, are you seeing people ch at board level change how they think? Uh, I, I think it's, it's starting to change, and I, I think uh, um, I think people initially tried uh, a lot of webinars, and, found, and people who were or the audience found them rather underwhelming. And I think uh, in in some cases, I mean, oh, this one, of course. You know, no, apart from this one, of course. <laughs> and but personally, I think I think one of the things that uh, I mean, Simon touched on again was that I, I've actually picked up the phone and spoken to my people on a regular basis, because I think that that personal touch um, shows that you actually care. And it's more about ha having that conversation which goes beyond work as well. And often it, it doesn't even reach um, the point where you discuss work until 20 minutes into the call. And I, th I think those sort of things are, it's this question of bringing communities together, because it's been eight months, Chris, and, and a lot of people feel forgotten. Uh, a lot of people haven't had the work. They've been on furlough, and uh, been and then brought back, and then on furlough again. So a lot of our younger people have just sort of uh, uh, are mystified that they spent so much time, money, educa educating themselves to become lawyers, and now they're suddenly finding they're not learning anything at all. So there are huge gaps in their knowledge and and their ability to say, look, what is important? Do I really want to be in the profession as well? So. I, th I think we, we're sort of uh, fighting on various fronts there, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I think I think uh, there is also a degree of uh, personal responsibility in terms of saying, uh, if I do need help, I should reach out, because other, otherwise people think you're fine. I mean, that's human nature. What did you learn during this period? How's it impacted on you? How's it changed you? For me, uh, I, I think I've become uh, um, happier. And then that I am sort of, uh, I'm, I'm, I know, I, I, I'll tell you why, because overall, I think uh, I, I listen more. Um, I get less agitated, apart from um, I, uh, the fact that I this, listen. This I period, three nights after the 3rd of November. Sorry, I interrupted you, but this period must be hell for you, because you love to travel and you love meeting people. No, no, okay, okay, travel is an addiction, but I think... Uh, and, and, and a passion as well. And if, if, if I mean, it's one thing I miss, but then I, I have started reading about travel and I've, st I've started planning uh, and, and listing all the places that I've not been to. But Chris, I, I think, I, think I, I still get up at the same time because I, I, every morning, 5.30, I still do my yoga, which, uh, which has uh, enabled me to be a lot more flexible and fitter, as you can see. And, uh, and, and, uh, and um, I do sleep much better as well. And, and I've appointed myself, uh, uh, self-appointed mayor of Maidavell, so I go out and talk to a lot of the shopkeepers there, and we, we have a little fun, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's humor, humor I find, I miss, I mean, if I, if I don't interact with people, I miss the humor, so I, and, but I, I, I think that um, I was in a good place before the pandemic, I, I, I'm lucky enough to be in the right place, but so for me, it's more important about saying, how can I help people that uh, need help, people that I've got to know over the years, whether through travel or elsewhere. And one example is we met, we had a tour guide in India last to last year for 14 days, and we thought he was amazing. And he, he came, he reached out to us and said he wanted to start a craft symposium. And, and we decided the money we would spend on a holiday, we happily sent it to him, and he's now doing well. But I, I, think, I think those sort of uh, benefits that you get by being being a decent human being, so I, th I think that's um, that's a huge plus for me. And Gavin, obviously, being a large company, I mean, it's all kinds of pressure the whole time. And have you have you sensed a real change? You know, it's really interesting. We've yeah. always had a very really strong company culture, and the thing I was most nervous about when we went into lockdown v one was 
that diminishing very quickly. And it's been fascinating to see how people have responded and reacted and created new ways of working and new ways of keeping in touch and making sure that that company culture is still strong, if not better. So we have weekly coffee catch-ups. We have, we have lots of mental health first aiders trained across the business. So we've made sure that there's lines open to all those people. Uh, we have been doing far more virtual activities in fundraising uh, for various causes. Um, and strangely, I would say that the company culture is, is stronger now. And, and as part of all of that, the d agenda has also risen. I mean, there's also political reasons for that. Uh, it does help that Alice uh, Woodock, the MD of the RA Group, is the champion for Compass Group UK. Um, and, you know, we've, we've taken this really important, uh, seriously. So, you know, I think things have changed quite dramatically on many different levels. Our behaviours, the way we interact with one another, what we're looking for, what, what's valuable and important to us as an organisation and individuals has, has, has grown again at exponential rates. And I think that's been really good allowing us to get for those really tricky bits. You know, we've obviously had some very challenging conversations over the past six months, but I think we feel a lot more stronger, but a lot more committed. And I think also, as Ramesh said, you know, we're all far more committed to our local environments as well. So, you know, I have a great relationship with the green grocers and with the coffee shop owners and uh, with the local butcher shops in a way that I never had before because I wasn't going out to those places. I was you know, mostly located in the city, and there's a disconnect from my own local arena. And I think that's been really good um, for myself and for the local areas as well, sort of, to, to have a far stronger sense of community there. So I, I look at this whole thing as very, in a very optimistic light. Yes, it's been difficult, but I think we've all grown very, very quickly into a better way of working together. It's interesting, isn't it? So do you support Ramesh's view that you're happier now out of interest? I think, I'd say I've personally grown and I've learned a lot more this year than probably any other year of my adult career. Um, am I happier? I think I do miss out on some of the liberties. I mean, again, traveling is really important to me. I have a place in Portugal, which I can't go to anymore. Um, so I do miss that. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm more connected to a lot of my friend uh, networks as well. We have lots of virtual activities too, so whether it's going to be film nights or it's going to be uh, the occasional run around the park. Um, I think in some ways, there's a lack of FOMO taking place nowadays. And there's a sort of gentle anxiety of living in central London that you're always missing out on something. And that's just disappeared, which I quite enjoy. Um, and I think also when you are going to do something, when we were out of lockdown, you really focused on what was important to you. So, you know, it was really looking for experiences so I would splash out on something more, more uh, memorable, whether it's going to, I don't know, say the Gavroche or one of Jason's restaurants, one of our restaurants. I, I would make more of an effort to do that as opposed to the sort of casual day-to-day -day, uh, goings out and, uh, and those kind of casual moments. So I don't know. I think it's allowed me to prioritize what's important to me uh, and be a lot more steadfast to that as opposed to just going along with the day-to-day. It's interesting. And in terms of work, how do you think the workplace is going to change, Ramesh? Well, I, I think, as I said uh, earlier, um, I, I, I think most of our younger employees are itching to go back to work simply because A, they want to learn, B, they want to reconnect with the age group that joined with them. They, they also want to know that they have a future because I, I think sitting at home, it's very difficult. You're almost sort of disconnected. And um, and I think they want to learn and they want to be they, they want to have a bit of fun as well, whether it's in the canteen or going out afterwards. So and I, I think that's not just restricted to the young people. I think a, a lot of us want to go back because that's where we've done our best work. That's where we come up with ideas. That's where we've shared our passions and sort of worked together, collaborated to get new clients and new opportunities as well. But I think if, even before this happened, I mean, uh, uh, most offices, uh, most law offices in central London, uh, people used to work from home on a Friday, or there used to be a dress down Friday, which I still don't understand. But uh, and, and, and then you had this situation where uh, people had got, got used to the idea of four, four days in the office and then wearing the office suit, etc. So if it means one day less, I think it's, 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 uh, it's almost an acceptable change for them. But it means you can then decide on the three days that you're going to be in the office 
And and you, I think at the end of the day, if I was a young lawyer starting out, I'd like to feel that my seniors do know that I'm there, I'm ambitious, I care, I can perform, I can deliver, and um, I'd like to go home thinking I have a career. So I think, I think as previous speakers said, I, I think the, the offices will, will be the place that people would want to clamber to first, even before their first holiday as such. But the main problem is going to be until we got a vaccine sorted out and how do you actually travel across from the West End into the city, which is, which is a frightening prospect, except if you do it today, you'll find that you get a cash to yourself, but that's not going to last more than a few weeks. I mean, it's very strange, isn't it, the kind of conversation we're having, because actually we're almost saying a pandemic's perhaps been a good thing in some ways. Um, yes, I, I think I think maybe maybe that's just an, an individual view, but I, th I think let's let's not forget. I mean, yesterday we had the statistics to show that for a country with our population, I mean, we uh, to have had fifty thousand deaths, it's 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 dreadful. I mean, it's ca catastrophic, um, and, and I mean. I know it's Mexico, uh, India, Brazil, and China above us. But I mean, those are those are very different countries and sort of much, much. Uh, I mean, bigger populations as well. But I, I, I mean, I, I, I think I'd rather not look back and just say, look, this has happened. It's tragic, and it's a question of saying how do we behave going forward. And I think the second lockdown. Uh, um, the strange, the strangest thing for me is that everybody's got their own interpretation of what they can, cannot do. Yeah, <laughs> I think the first one, the government actually terrified us into staying at home. This one, I think, uh, it's uh, being a lawyer is interesting because I'm forever being asked, "Can I do this?" And I, <laughs> and I say, "No." They said, "Oh well, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing this." But so every, everybody I know is actually breaking the law. <laughs> sad to say, I'm sad to say that. That's an interesting observation. Um, and Gavin, how do you, and coming out of this, how are clients? What's the mood amongst clients that you see? You know, it's, it's been interesting. It's a bit of a roller coaster. And I, I don't think there's a one size fits all when it comes to clients. I mean, we work across the whole of the UK, but we have a particular basis in Kerry Wharf Bank uh, and the West End, where there's going to be our tech clients such as Omnicom or Google, or some of our city clients like City and KPMG. Um, I think they've all had a very different response to this. Some have been very embracing of reopening the spaces, uh, of welcoming people back if they feel, felt safe to. They've put the COVID secure measurements into place. We've been very, very strict about that. Um, and the people who came back were really enjoying it. And, you know, a lot of our places are also key worker environments. Uh, so, you know, they have to continue trading, uh, particularly all the banking institutions or people like Global Radio. Um, so it's a real mixed bag, bad, uh, bag of, uh, of responses. Um, I think people are really looking forward to reopening the businesses wholeheartedly. Uh, I think things will change. I think people are looking for a bit more when they come back to the office space now. I think experiences is a big part of that. I think they're going to come back for more collaboration, for the creativity, for that camaraderie, for developing those relationships. I think we've been... But we've backed all the kudos of working with people for a long time to get us through these really challenging months of working at home, the virtual activities, etc. But that's only going to take us so far. Uh, I think as soon as the vaccine has come into place, we're still working with um, new developments, particularly so with Google and King's Cross and elsewhere. We've just opened the stock gen building in Kenowoff as well. Beautiful space. You know, people can't wait to get back into those environments safely. Uh, and that's the number one priority. But, you know, I think the way that people will use them will change. I think there'll be more co-working. I think we will be redesigning some of those spaces. I think those co-collaborations, those meeting rooms, et cetera, are going to become more and more important. I think the workplace will change. Uh, I think Ramesh is right. I think people will be coming back maybe four or three days a week. Um, but there's certain things that people get from the work environment that you just can't get from home. And, um, you know, I think that will always be part of it. I think it's just a human need, a human desire to want to be around like-minded people, to spring ideas of one another. And also those casual collusions, you know, uh, as some of our uh, clients are really focused on encouraging different departments to get together in a very casual, sometimes a formal setting, you know, to bounce ideas off one another. And you just can't get that in the virtual world. It's interesting 
I've noticed the first time around, the people who I spoke to a lot through, we use Teams a lot, or Zoom, um, changed from my day to day when I'm in an office. And that was a positive and a negative. I think the office just gives you far more holistic uh, perspective on what is happening in a business. And then because of that, you know, uh, mixed approach, there's different opinions. I think you can create a far stronger business operation. So I, I think people can't wait for the vaccine to be uh, implemented across the UK. I think it will, people will spring back to the cities very, very quickly. Uh, there, there has to be another change, which is a uh, lot of offices are also very sterile environments where you walk in and you see 200 people with headsets um, over the ears and, um, and watching a screen. And the only time you hear them is when they start munching on crisps and annoying you. And, and, and I, I think, I think um, people, for, for those, those people, I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether that's going to make any difference because I think uh, there is a certain group of people who just come there and just spend their time that way. They may say hello to you if they bump into you, but not otherwise. But then, then I think I think uh, we're, we're looking at the people who really make a difference and who want to make a difference, and how they approach it. So I, I think uh, there has to be a lot of change in terms of the office culture as well. And uh, Chris, if I can just mention, say for example, I mean, there's uh, Anushka on on, uh, on on this call uh, listening and. And she's done some research for me. And McKinsey did a piece of research in India. 80% of the young people don't want to go back to the offices because firstly, they have very long commutes. And then they are expected to be in the office till 9, 10 at night. And then they have another journey back and they're still looking at the screen whilst, uh, whilst in the cab. And so all they do is, uh, is they never see their parents until the weekend. All they do is go home to sleep and then come back again. So it's, it's almost like saying, but it's, it's, it's almost expected of them because if you don't follow that culture, um, you're not retained as such. So I think that there's, um, there's going to be some interesting thinking in those places as well. And then those are the places where you find technology has advanced so much. So I think um, there'll be a, some uh, great breakthroughs. I, I mean, that's, that's my hope. I keep my fingers crossed. Um, that is a good point to leave on. So it's going to be fascinating. But thank you for your time. It's been really good having you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your course. Thanks. Actually, I think there's been really some fascinating things to come out today. Lauren, can I just bring you in to give us your thoughts and wrap up? But thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Yeah, I think what you touched on is um, possibly the most, or one of the most important bits is that there's been this, this change in thinking that um, people are embracing the, the, the thinking around how important people are. I mean, we've said for how many years now <laughs> that uh, people need to be at the, the center of, of everything. People are the most important. They are the most valuable. And it's, um, I know that there's been a lot of talk about that in the future, but it seems that that talk is now um, turning into actions, which is really, I think, great to see. No, I think there's been some really interesting uh, comments made today, haven't there? And actually you can see that things are really, people given a lot of thought how services are gonna change. And actually, I think coming out of this, the industry is far stronger for it. I, I do agree. And you said, um, and, well, probably not, not most PC comment, but you said, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has been fantastic. That uh, it, it's okay, fantastic. my interpretation, <laughs> um, that it's, it's created this, um, this positive change that we have been um, moving towards, you know, slowly, slowly. Um, and, you know, like the other inappropriate uh, comments of, you know, never waste a good crisis. And I, it seems that we definitely are not doing that. My hope for the future is that people are, are treated better, that there are, um, that there, you know, th they aren't just numbers, that there is well, a... I think that, yeah, look, I think the thing came out, the deaths are tragic and the, and the crisis is tragic. Let's not get that wrong. But the point is, actually, this has given people a real chance to reflect on their business and on themselves and on their purpose. But actually, I suspect it's going to create some real positive change coming out of it. Absolutely. And, and new models. And, and that's always so exciting. Like you say, there's always, um, you know, post any crisis, there's innovation. And we love innovation in our industry, um, the, the changes that, that we're going to see. So I'm very excited. And I'm excited to work out whether we are a, um, a hugger or a hopper. So um, <laughs> I look forward to, to that one. I think I might just be a hybrid between the two. 
I know great speakers and um, thank you very much to everyone who has given their time and I know we're over so thank you for for um, hanging on with us it's definitely worth worth the time and we appreciate your well we appreciate you full stop have a good day thank you see you soon